Okay, is the mic live? Yeah, we're good. Okay, um, hi everybody, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so, uh, this is going to be a talk about tools. And um, there's this common expression that says that a carpenter is only as good as his or her tools. Um, I'm, I'm not a carpenter, but that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, if your hammer is made out of feathers, uh, you're not going to be able to build very much. And I really think the same thing is true for programmers. Um, I know that that is true. The tools that we use really uh, enable us to do our job. And we use so many tools, it's easy to sort of take for granted uh, the tools that we have and the tools that we do use. And so uh, I think it's worth sort of thinking about the tools that we have and how they help us improve as a programmer and thinking about what new tools we can use. Um, in this case, I'll be talking specifically about mutation testing and how that as a tool can really help us all improve as programmers, help us write better tests. But um, I think I just want to sort of take some time to reflect and, and set a little bit of a context for the tools that we use every day and, and sort of, I think, take for granted a bit. So uh, the first one is an editor. Um, and it seems like a very simple tool, right? You just type in text and it shows up on the screen. Um, but it's incredibly sophisticated. Uh, if you've ever tried to write a text editor, if you've ever read the source code of a text editor, most text editors are like millions of lines of code um, to implement what seems like a relatively simple thing. Um, and they help us. They provide us with things like syntax highlighting, auto-completion. Um, and this directly helps us write better programs, right? We avoid bugs. We'll realize a bug in our editor before we, before we deploy it to production, before we even run tests. We'll find a bug uh, in our editor because our editor tells us about it. Um, this is an early version of Vim. <laughs> so. Um, it, can, it can be really easy to forget sort of what these tools used to look like, right? This is how people used to write code. Um, and these look more like the sort of tools from the wood shop than the tools that we're used to using. So this is uh, an early punch card machine. The photo was taken in the, uh, in the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. And uh, I can tell you for a fact that I would not be a programmer today if this is how we still had to write programs. And I suspect that many of you would not be programmers um, if this was sort of the state of the art in how it was done. And so I, I think, like, I want to make the case that sort of both the quality and the quantity of software uh, would be much worse than it is today, if not for sort of the continued evolution of, of our tools. Um, another tool I use every day is an interactive debugger. So. Um, sort of allows you to step through your code line by line and better understand how it works. You can kind of get inside the code, right? Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about debuggers, sort of public a service announcement. Uh, next week, uh, not next week, this week, next Thursday, this Thursday, um, in this same room, I believe, uh, is a great talk on debugger-driven development with Pry. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, you should go to that. So uh, what do we do when our code is slow? What's the tool for that, right? We have profilers that tell us where time is being spent when we execute our code. And I wouldn't even know how to start optimizing a program if I didn't have a profile, right? Profiler. I would be a terrible optimizer without a profiler. I guess I would like start putting in, uh, you know, t equals time dot now, and then like at the end of whatever I wanted to measure, I would subtract the current time from the start time. But that's crazy. Like, instrumenting your entire code that way is, uh, yeah, like, I, I wouldn't really know how to optimize code without a profiler. I wouldn't be as good at it. None of us would. And um, another sort of tool that is very prevalent in the, in the Ruby community is testing. Um, this is an example of someone who should have done more testing. I'll show that again. Just. Yeah. Right, so um, I think this is a, a good illustration of how testing 
can save you, right? <laughs> Test so that you find out before you sort of run it in production. Okay. Enough of that. Um, so I, I I'm actually going to make the case that in the Ruby Ruby toolbox, or maybe in the Rubyist toolbox, uh, tests are sort of like the hammer, right? Like this is the thing we turn to all the time for all sorts of things. Uh, we use them to prevent regressions. We use them to specify behavior. Uh, and we actually use them to drive development. Uh, DHH doesn't do this, but <laughs> many others do and find it useful. So um, if we write tests, then we have perfect code, right? If we have tests that verify that our code does what it's supposed to do, then at the end of the day, we have perfect code. Correct? Not correct. Um, this is the fundamental logical flaw with testing, right? You have some code, and uh, you know that code can have bugs, so you say, I have an idea. Let's write some tests. But tests are just more code, and we know that code has bugs, so we're screwed. Test your tests. What's that? Test your tests. Test your tests, right. So um, we're getting there. Patience. Um, so like one tool that people use to sort of measure the effectiveness of their tests is code coverage. And um, it's sort of a metric that's designed to tell you whether your, your tests do what they're supposed to do. But I'll show you uh, in a moment why I think it's a really flawed metric and why it sort of can give you a false sense of security, right? Um, a lot of people think that they have 100% code coverage um, and that means like their code is perfect and bug free, or if they reach that level, then their code will be perfect and bug free. Um, but this is not true, right? Like this guy thinks he's covered and he's not. Um, and code coverage is actually like it's something that was built into Ruby, right? Like in Ruby 193, this is something that like we as a programming community said like we want to have. Um, and I'm not against it. Like I think it's good, but um, I, I do think it can give you a false sense of security, right? I thought this was a funny tweet. So you can have 100% code coverage and still have completely bug-ridden code. So, so is there hope for us, right? Like, how do, we, how do we test our tests? It's sort of this problem of, like, who will watch the watchers, right? Who, do we, who can we trust? If we can't trust our tests, how, why, why are we even writing them? And I'm going to try to make the case that mutation testing is the sort of solution to this problem. So uh, just like everything else, like an editor, like an interactive debugger, like a profiler, like tests, uh, mutation testing is a tool. Uh, the basic idea behind it is that it takes your tests and it runs them against your code, and they should pass. Um, and if they do pass, then what it does is it takes your code and it makes a modification to your code. It actually changes your code at runtime. And then it runs your tests against, again against a modified version of your code. And the idea is that when that code is modified, the test that previously passed should now fail. Right? So the thing, the, your modified code is called a mutant. And the idea is that if that test fails, you kill the mutant. Right? The mutant dies. But if that mutant survives, then that means there's something wrong with your tests. There might not be something wrong with your code, but there's certainly something wrong with your tests. Either you have a bug in your tests, you have missing tests, your tests are, are either over-specified or under-specified. So this is a technique. It's very helpful for sort of answering the question, uh, what test should I write? Which I think is a, a question that many of us struggle with. It's certainly something that uh, beginners struggle with when they're starting a program. Like, how do I, how do I write tests? What, what do I test? Right? And then there's also this question of, like, how do I know when I'm done? How do I know when the code is sufficiently tested? And um, I think these are actually hard questions to ask, uh, or hard questions to answer. And uh, mutation, mutation testing provides a, a quantitative answer to those questions. You can say with confidence that this code has 100% mutation coverage. So. Um, just to sort of give an example, here is some code and an assertion about the code. So I have a method foo. 
It takes an argument whose default is true, and uh, the actual method body for foo is either uh, return that argument or fail. And my assertion says, assert nothing raised if I call the method foo without passing in any parameters. And so, uh, without passing in any arguments to the arg parameter, rather. And so what, uh, you know, th this test will pass, right? Um, arg, you call foo, arg is true, and it sort of short circuits, right? It sees arg, it sees the or, and this test passes. So maybe you think this is a good test, maybe you think you're done writing your tests, but you are not. And a mutant of that code, a small modification, a sort of unit modification of that code, might look like this. And basically what it did is it just sort of took that or fail and removed it. And the idea is that if you do that, at least one of your tests should now, that was passing before should now fail. One of your tests over that code for that foo method should now fail. And if it does not, then you are not testing your code sufficiently. So uh, this is called a statement deletion mutation. There are various other types of mutation. So uh, for example, there are mutations that would take that default parameter and change it from true to false, or from true to nil, right? Which would also cause uh, failure in this case. Um, there's another mutation that will take the or and change it to an and, right? So anytime there's sort of uh, a unit in your code. It takes greater than signs and changes them to less than or equal to signs, et cetera. Right? It takes ifs and changes them to unless. It will take whole expressions and negate them and make sure that your tests fail when the, when the negation of a statement is, uh, when the method returns the negation of the statement instead of the statement. Right? So that's, that's sort of the core idea behind mutation testing. And so you end up sort of writing these tests to cover all these cases that, um, and then you sort of know when you're done, right? Like you know when all of your tests, uh, when, when your code is fully mutation covered. Uh, this is another tweet. This one from Katrina Owen. And it's sort of this idea, it's kind of like both horrifying and satisfying at the same time. But if you sort of add more granular tests, you'll find more bugs. And in many cases, mutant, which is a mutation testing framework, will find those bugs for you. That's the tool. Okay, so I promised there would be live coding. This is sort of the introduction is over, and now we will write some code. Hopefully. I'm just going to switch to mirror displays. Command F1. That is a pro tip. That's great. You're a pro. I clearly am not. OK, cool. Um, cool. And a new version of Mutant was like just released a few minutes ago <laughs> in advance of this uh, presentation. I am not uh, the author of Mutant. Uh, it's a great library by Marcus Sherp. Um, and I'd encourage you all to check it out, uh, version 0.5.11, hot off the presses. So um, this is some code. So like the, the sort of thrust behind this live coding demo is I will not be live coding code, I will be live coding tests. Because the idea is not to, like mutant doesn't verify that your code is correct, it verifies that your tests are correct. So you still need to write tests, right? Tests verify that your code is correct, mutant verifies that your test is correct. So this is the code, and it's pretty, um, pretty simple, but we'll sort of walk through it line by line, just to make sure everyone has a good understanding of it. And so uh, there's this module that represents the universe, the entire universe. And inside of the universe, we have planets. And that's what this class is all about. Um, it's a pretty simple planet. It takes a radius and an area as parameters uh, when it's constructed and stores those in instance variables. Uh, the radius is the mean radius of the planet and, uh, in kilometers. And the area is sort of the surface area uh, of the planet in square kilometers. And then there's one sort of interesting method, uh, one public method, 
spherical. And uh, spherical will return true if, uh, if the planet is a perfect sphere or within a particular tolerance of that. So the idea is we calculate the approximate area using 4 pi r squared, which is the formula to calculate the uh, area of a sphere. And if the uh, area sort of matches that, then we know it's a sphere. We know it's spherical. This method returns true. And if, uh, if that's not true, then the planet is not spherical. It's either oblate, like the Earth, or prolate. And um, then this method will return false. So yeah, we just sort of calculate the approximate area. And then we have this range private method that just generates a range. Uh, we need sort of a tolerance. The idea is you don't want it to be uh, too precise, because we're dealing with pi. So pi is, um, I mean, in actuality, it's a non-terminating number. In Ruby, uh, it has like 10 digits of precision or something like that, right? Like the constant math pi. But the idea is that like, if it's close enough to a sphere within a particular tolerance, then we'll just call it round, basically. And so we generate this range, which is sort of the approximate area that we've calculated based on the radius, plus or minus the tolerance. And we see if the area falls within those bounds. Does everyone understand this code? I think it is pretty simple. I tried to make it fit on one screen, on one slide. Yeah? OK, so um, if everyone understands it, I want to take a little bit of a poll. This is kind of like the interactive part of the talk. And you have to, like, everyone has to participate. That's the, that's the rule. Everyone, I, people like to sort of sit by the sidelines and not commit, but you have to commit. I'll be really angry if you don't. You don't want to see me angry. So um, how many tests do you think you need to fully cover this code, to cover the public methods, the, the spherical method, right, so that it's sort of fully exercised. Who thinks you need zero tests? Show of hands. Anybody? No. Good. I agree. You can't cover code without tests, so it's good. You've been paying some attention. <laughs> Who thinks you can do it with one test? Maybe sort of the happy path, right? You write a test that says, uh, you know, you expect some planet to be spherical given a uh, radius and an area, and it is all good. Who thinks that's sufficient? Nobody. So you can actually get C0, 100% C0 co code coverage of this entire class with one test, with one spec, right? You won't have 100% mutation coverage, but I will show you in a minute, you can have 100% C0 code coverage, despite the fact that nobody in this room thinks that that is sufficient to cover this code. <laughs> so I will prove it to you, but you all intuitively know this to be the case. And yet, we all idolize this C0 code coverage metric as if it means something. And really, it, it should, it's a false sense of security, right? You're the guy with the umbrella in the hurricane, and the umbrella is like destroyed and inside out. OK. So um, how many people think you can do it with two tests? OK. Uh, somebody who's raising your hand, this gentleman in the front, what are the two tests that you would write, just sort of roughly? Maybe the happy path and what other? Uh, one, that's one that's spherical and one that's not. OK. I think that's good. Uh, how many people think you would need three to do it? OK. Maybe gentleman there who thinks you need three. What's the third you would write? Say it again, a value for tolerance. It will blow up the computation. How would you blow up the computation? Passing in a string? OK. Um, great. And what would you expect the result to be? Like, what would your expectation, what would you assert? Like, I pass in a string, and I expect an exception. OK. And if you didn't get an exception, then that would be a problem. OK. 
Um, okay. Uh, who thinks four will do it? Nobody thinks four will do it. A few people do. Uh, yeah. What's, what additional tests would you add? Mm. Great. I really like this. So uh, the comment was that you're testing a range, and there's sort of two sides. There's the, I'm on the low end of the range, and I'm included, and I'm on the high end of the range. So it would be, there's two of those. Right, one for the low end and one for the high end. Exactly. So it's sort of the happy path, the thing is spherical, the sad path, the thing is not spherical, and both sides of the range. I like that. Good. Um, how many people think five? Five or more, how's that? Five or more, okay, lots of hands for five or more. So, um, according to Mutant, which is also software, therefore imperfect, um, you, can, you can test this with four. And it will not handle things like you should, like it sort of assumes that the radius and area are valid, right? Like you, you can, although actually maybe that's, well, we can try it. It's a live coding thing, so let's just do it and see what happens. But thank you for participating in that. I think it's an, an interesting exercise. But um, yeah, basically, like Newton says, the answer to this question is four, right? It's basically the happy path, the sad path, and both sides of the range. So um, yeah, let's let's sort of show how that works. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to start by just making a gem file, as you do. So that, let me, I can just sort of show, it's a very simple uh, layout so far. I have a lib directory, which contains universe.rb, which you've all seen, and um, a spec directory, which is empty. So very little up my sleeve at this point. I'm just going to make a gem file, as you do. And uh, at this point, I'm just going to add RSpec, because I'm starting to write some tests, and I'm going to add mutant. OK, so and we'll bundle install. Ah, cool. It just installed that new version of, bun of uh, mutant that was just released moments ago. Good. <laughs> uh, let me just see what Ruby version I'm on. OK, that should be fine. So. Um, uh, let's write some specs. So we have the spec directory. Let's write uh, planet spec dot rb, and we'll uh, require our spec, and we'll require our planet file. I'll just use require relative for that, rather than messing with the load path or anything. So that's up a directory in lib, and I think it's called universe. And uh, now let's start writing our specs, right? So we're just going to describe our uh, planet in our universe module. And um, so let's create a subject, which is just going to be our planet. That's like the main thing that we're going to be testing here. And it's initialized with a radius and an area. I believe in that order. Yep. Cool. So um, let's uh, create a context. And uh, let's do the happy path first, because that was kind of like we all agreed that the first test we should write was the happy path. So um, in this case, Venus is actually the happy path. Um, Venus is pretty darn close to the spherical. Um, so in this case, uh, We'll define the radius to be oops, cool. Uh, and I think I said it's in uh, meters, yeah? So it'll be that, and then the area will be uh, 
Um, let's see. Wikipedia. OK, so the surface area is, what is that, 460 million, um, which is OK, but actually, like, I would like a more precise number because like, I don't want to crank up our tolerance to some ridiculous value to make this true. Um, so I actually found a more precise number than the one that's on Wikipedia, which is this. So it's 460 million, 264,740, which is you know pretty round number still, but it's more precise than the one on Wikipedia. And uh, now we'll have our assertion. So we'll just say it's spherical. Venus is spherical. We expect our subject to be spherical. Good. Is everyone satisfied? Do I, like, if people see bugs, call them out. Like, does this look like a good happy path test? Yes, this will pass. Good. Uh, let's run it. Uh, yeah, that should work. Cool, it passed. Hooray. Um, let's do something else. Let's open up our gem file again and add simplecov to measure the C0 code coverage. And uh, I guess here we can just say require simplecov, simplecov start. And so now if we run our specs again, we'll get a little coverage report. Ta-da! Um, so for those who aren't that familiar with SimpleCov, basically it looks to make sure that, you're, um, that every line of code is executed. And if you test the happy path, it totally is, right? Um, the class, the module is loaded, the class is loaded, uh, this constant is set, we initialize, um, we initialize a planet, uh, I can turn on, Lines. We initialize a planet on line nine. We uh, invoke the spherical method uh, on line 15 in the assertion, and uh, that invokes the range method. So we have, you can actually see every line of code is executed precisely one time. So we have, we're not over testing, we're not under testing, we have perfect 100% C0 code coverage. But we all agreed that this was completely insufficient. So, <laughs> ship it. Right, good. Force push. <laughs> um, I'm going to delete this simple cub stuff because it's garbage. <laughs> OK, so um, let's write some more tests. So a planet that's not spherical is, no, that's my name. Thank you. is our home, the Earth, um, radius of the Earth. Cool. I guess we could say point 0.1, doesn't really matter. And, oops. What's the area? Cool. So in square kilometers, it's 510, and uh, 510 million, rather. So we, again, we could like, try to find a number that's more precise, but we actually, like, the whole point of this test is to test a planet that is an oblate spheroid, not an actual sphere. And so in this case, we want to, so like it's fine that the numbers are not within the default tolerance. Um, and so, yeah, basically we want to say like it is oblate, uh, not spherical. So in this case, we expect our subject not to be spherical. Cool. 
Look good? Let's run it. Cool. Our test pass. So uh, this is like maybe your normal workflow. You would do this. A few of you would stop at this point. I think there were probably as many hands for like I would stop at two, or probably more tests for like I would stop at two than I would stop at four um, or three. But let me, show, uh, let me show what mutant does. Let me show sort of how this mutation testing stuff works. So um, you're going to say bundle exec, um, or I, don't know, I have it alias to be. I can spell it out. Um, so this is the mutant command line, and it takes a bunch of arguments. So uh, you have to give it a lib for the sort of lib directory that you're testing so that it knows to add that to the load path. And then um, you give it a require. So it's going to require some specific library, in this case, the universe library that you wrote. Um, and then you can say, like, I want to test everything in universe. So you can say, like, with wild cards, like, colon, colon, universe, star. Here, I can make that a little smaller so it fits on one line. Um, or you can say, like, I want to test specifically the planet class. Or you can say, like, I want to test a particular method. So you can say, like, I want to test spherical, something like that. Right? But we want to test the whole planet class. Uh, oh, and you also, there's an option to say use RSpec so it knows what test framework to run. This is important because it's testing your tests. And I'm getting some sort of an error. Ah, I am missing mutant RSpec in my gem file. That is easy to fix. Right. So, uh, RSpec used to be built in. This has changed recently. So basically, there are other libraries. Uh, there's like plugin libraries. So if you want to write, if you, uh, if you use some crazy test framework, you can just write a gem that adds mutant support for that test framework. So this happens to be the one for RSpec, but um, you can use one for test unit or anything else. So I will. BI is just a shortcut for bundle install. And I will do this. Cool. So what it is doing. You're like, what? This is crazy. We only wrote two tests. Why are there all those little green dots and Fs flying by? So basically, what's happening is um, we, it's taking our two tests, and it's running through these various mutations. In this case, it made 83 mutations to our code based on what we used, right? Like, so depending on, like, if you use an AND, it will convert it to an OR. But if you don't use that, you can't do that mutation. Um, so in this case, there was 83 mutations, uh, 83 sort of mutants, and 82 of those mutants were killed. So um, there, in this case, was one that was not. And you get this really cool output, uh, diff output. So it basically says, this is the mutation we did that was not killed. We took. Uh, what is it, line 24? What is that? Is there a comment? We took uh, line 25, right, this range method, and we deleted the code that you wrote, and we mutated it in this way. We got rid of that minus t. And it turned out that even after we made that mutation, all of your tests still passed. Actually, maybe it would be helpful. Like, I can show with Earth. So b before we do Earth, this is what the mutation output would look like, right? So I just want to give you a sense of like all the different mutations and kind of how they work and what the output looks like. So if we don't have the sort of unhappy path where it returns false, these are the various mutations it runs. So there was this one, which we saw earlier, where it removes the minus t from the range, and it still passes because we're sort of in the top half of that range. Um, there's this other one where it gets rid of the n, so the beginning part of the range, and it just puts in t there. Uh, here, it actually gets rid of that call to dot cover. And it turns out that because the range returns true, and you haven't put in a thing that says it should return false, um, that this also passes. Right? So in this case, you're just returning the range, but that is truthy, and so this, uh, this test fails. If you wanted to write a more precise test, Instead of saying, uh, no, I guess that's right. So in this case, it's just going to check whether uh, that method is truthy or falsy. And in this case, it's truthy if it just returns the range. Right? And you're not testing that it would ever be falsy. 
Uh, also, if you just return the instance variable area. So if you basically throw away everything except that last argument to the cover method, this turns out to also, um, like, the, you have no test that covers this, right? And actually, you can delete that whole line, and the previous line, approximate area, um, like, you get the same result, right? Like, the fact that you have an approximate area, and that is truthy, and that you are only testing that this method returns a truthy value means that this test will pass. So um, I just wanted to show that. I can bring this back. Cool. So now we're in a place where, oops, okay, so our tests still pass. And we have one mutant that we need to kill. So does anyone have an idea for how to kill this mutant? So uh, the suggestion was to pass in a zero tolerance, so let's try that. So uh, should I just, um, should we make up a planet, or how do you want to do that? We could do Mars, maybe? Venus shouldn't be spherical if the tolerance is zero. Ah, Venus shouldn't be spherical if the tolerance is zero. So that's true. So we can sort of change this one to be, it is spherical given the default tolerance. Yep. That's what that tests. Right, it's spherical-ish. I like that. Ish. Um, but is not perfectly spherical. And so uh, here we would expect this not to be spherical given a tolerance of zero. Yeah? So let's first run that test. Cool, so that passes. It is not perfectly spherical, and it is spherical-ish. Um, we didn't break that test. OK, so now let's uh, do the same thing with our mutant command. So the mutant still lives. Wipe. So to make this fail, what we need to do is we need to pass in a tolerance that falls in the bottom half of the range. So in this case, Venus is slightly, the area of Venus is slightly above the perfect sphere, sphericism or whatever, right? Um, it's not, uh, it's, it's on the high end of the range. So what we need to do is we need to find a planet that is actually uh, on the low end of the range, right? Where it's less, it's uh, spherical, but within the tolerance, but it's, uh, yeah, on the low end of the range. Make sense? So, um, yeah, I don't know. Like, what we could do to test, like, we could, I, I don't want to necessarily, like, look up more planets and their radiuses, but we could do something like this. So, um, this is, uh, sorry, that's not Earth. This is, like, um, Rubinius 5, I like that. Thank you for the suggestion from the audience. And Rubinius 5, uh, let's sort of make it easy for ourselves. So we'll say the radius is uh, 0 0.5, right? So if we put that in our formula, uh, 0 0.5 squared is a quarter. And then um, a quarter when sort of cancels out the multiple by 4. You div you're dividing by 4, basically. So the, we know that the actual area should be pi. So then we can just say something like, let the area be uh, math pi. Um, and we want it to fall. Uh, we want the area to be below the range, right? So we want it to be like math pi minus like some amount that falls within the tolerance or whatever, right? Makes sense? And then we expect that this is uh, going to be spherical-ish within the default tolerance. Cool. OK, so let's run that. 
specs pass. And have we killed the last mutant? Nice. We have. Yeah. So.